Listener Production. I'm automotive commentator and journalist Greg Rust, and this is Rusty's Garage. They say it's important to live a full life. My guest today has done that. And even though he's just clocked 70 on the odometer, there's signs that he'll only ease off the throttle rather than coming off it completely. Rob Herridge has titles and trophies in power boating, barefoot water skiing, and he turned his attention to rally later than most, but succeeded at that too. He was skillful with clay target shooting as a young bloke and... Is on target for more silverware now that there is less driving involved. There's been some safari competition to satisfy the love of driving in post-ARC life and decades running the family business, Maximum Motorsport, prepping competition cars for clients, running some of them at events, building and modifying to cope with the rigours of rally and on occasion, for a few, just for pure enjoyment. The common denominator is Subaru and the relationship dates back decades with STI enthusiasts turning to them right around the country for parts now. For this one, I'm not in the studio though, rather in their workshop, buy some cool cars with history that's important to Rob and his son Dean. I'm grateful to Dino, who I do some broadcasting with for teeing up this episode. You'll hear about Dean's career too. That's later, and yes, we will get him on the pod at some stage. As always, we begin with the foundation, some early life yarns that will give you a sense of Rob's makeup, why he became such a good engineer with the kind of competitive drive that you tend to learn while you're young. And he's done some commentary with his buddy Ross Dunkerton over the years too, so he can talk. Buckle up, enjoy the ride. Well, welcome. It is great to kind of tell a bit of your story. And I love to start these things with a little bit of, you know, where you grew up and how you got started and so on. And you were kind of wheat farming built in north of Perth, weren't you? Well, east of Perth. East of Perth, East of Perth, yeah, yeah. East of Perth. I grew up in a little place called Janicabine, and mm-hmm. no one knows much about Janicabine. Uh, the genial giant uh, Jack Clark, who used to play uh, a, a VFL football, came from Janicabine. But myself and Jack Clark about the only... I shouldn't say that because Janicabine people are, are treasures. Yeah. But a cyclone went through Janicabine years ago and did a million dollars worth of improvements. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was a nice place. It was a bit of a purple patch, a very good wheat and sheep area. Mm-hmm. Um, they had football and hockey and tennis. Uh, but we had a farm that had a, a lake on it, so I did a lot of water skiing as well. Okay. So were there, I mean, water skiing points to that, were there other kind of influences that have ultimately... Uh, maybe led you to this motorsport path? Were there dirt bikes? Were there, was it farm machinery and things? What were, how soon before you were mucking around with motorised things? Oh, pretty soon because we had uh, two farms and they were 20 kilometres apart and uh, the, the pub was in the middle of those two, <laughs> between those two farms. Yeah. And uh, from the pub to our home farm was through my grandparents' farm. My grandparents weren't alive and didn't own it at the time, but it was a bit of a track. And I thought I was the world rally champion going to and from the pub, especially coming home from the pub. Uh, It comes to pass that I was nowhere near the world rally champion because I had no idea how fast rally drivers drove. Mm. But I did a lot of water skiing and that got me involved in boats, of course. So we went from water skiing, uh, competition, competition barefooting, to racing boats, inshore power boats, offshore power boats. But my father died when I was 19 and I'd Mm. already uh, was racing motocross bikes. Uh, he had no interest in motorsports, he was into football and uh, nearly everybody around me was into football but I wasn't much good at football. So I suppose I was looking for uh, a bit of something else and on the farm we had farm bikes of course. And, um, but my uncle Bob who accompanied me on some of the ARC events I did, he was into motorsport but he was a, a Perth copper mm-hmm. and he didn't have much money but uh, that's probably where I got the connection with a bit of motorsport. Cool. You've touched on a number of things that I want to come back to here individually but first of all, is it true that you may have set fire to your cupboard as a kid? Is it, did, the, did this happen? And, uh... Well, I've got 12 grandchildren between my wife, Debbie, and myself, and a couple of them are little rat bags. 
But I, I hope that they always grow out of that because I'm, according to my aunties and my sisters, I was a rat bag. <laughs> and um, I'm probably doing way, more th- way worse things than my kids, certainly way worse things than my kids did, way mm. worse kids, way worse things than my grandkids did. Mm. And yes, I didn't set fire to the wardrobe, I lit a fire on top of the wardrobe. <laughs> That's an entirely different thing. <laughs> and I set fire to the paddock outside the house and when my parents came home from wherever they were, they found it's pretty hard to disguise the fact that the paddock's been on fire. But fortunately, it was a little triangle where the, in between where the vehicles drove and I was able to put it out. And I, I had no idea why I did that, but mm-hmm. maybe it was just to see if I could put it out. Mm. And fortunately, I could put both of them out. Yep. Uh, the, the sporting stuff intrigues me because if I'm right, your mum was quite a good hockey player. Yes, maybe. she was, yeah. and, and your dad, I, I think, administratively worked around the football team yes, and so yeah, on too. Yeah, yeah. So do you think those sporting influences um, ha- had an impact on you from a perhaps a competitive makeup or, or a um, you know I mean you, you've done so many different pursuits you've rattled off the boating there before we know about your rallying you're quite good from a, a shooting standpoint these yeah. days and were, even when you were younger but did that influence you from a competitive sense I think so um, my father was um, was a very well respected football administrator he was president of the local club never play, played a game of football in his life but he mm. was the club president he was association president. They, um, the Premiership Shield was in the name of my grandfather and none of the brothers played, but they were all involved in, in sport. And but my mother was a very competitive sportswoman. She uh, was very good at hockey, uh, represented the state in croquet, and uh, she was very good at darts. Um, and she didn't always win, okay. but if she didn't win, she would come back to the farm and we lived together on the farm because as I said, my father died when I was only a teenager. Mm. And she would say, Robert, you've got to spend a bit of time with me this week playing darts because when I go back next week, I am going to win. Okay. And, um, and I think that's sort of stuck with me that, um, you know, if, if you first don't succeed, let's not just um, bail out, let's come mm. up with a plan and let's practice and let's train harder and um, we'll go at it a bit harder. So, so let's extend that a little bit if we can, just around the, the shooting. I mean, you do some, I think it's, is it clay target yes, shooting that you do, you do now? And I think as a young fella, you were doing a bit of that. And typically as you are now, you, you're, you're immersed in it, you know a lot about it in the same way that you do with your, your motor racing. Did you kind of get a little bit of a lesson in, in maybe almost sports psychology from your, your Uncle Roy because you came up against each other when you were battling for, a, for an event or a title? Is that, is yes. that right? I don't know whether, I've told the story many times and I'm actually now starting to doubt whether it was true, but <laughs> it's close enough to be true. true. He, was, yeah. uh, he, he could line his, his house with sashes. I've got a few state sashes that I hang up very proudly. And depending on how, uh, uh, how big the event is, it depends on the colour of the sash, like a national sash is a certain colour, mm. a state sash is a certain colour. But I always remember we would go to dinner at Uncle Roy's place and he was only like my godfather sort of thing. And he had more sessions than you can poke a stick at. Mm. But uh, he and I, in shooting, if you shoot, um, if it's a 50 target event and you shoot 50, well, you're probably not gonna win outright, but you'll be in a shoot off to decide the winner. And I was in a shoot off with my Uncle Roy and I was very proud of that because he was the sheriff, he was the, the champion and I was just the up and coming kid. And as I went to shake his hand, he, uh, to wish him good luck in the shoot off and we would decide the winner. He gave me the very abrupt get. Eft. Eft. And, um, <laughs> and it, it sort of, it shocked me a little bit. And uh, while I was thinking about why would he say that? And of course I missed one of the first few targets and he won and as we we're walking off, he gave me a bit of a pat on the back. He said, sorry about that son, but shooting, shooting and winning's winning. And, um, that was that. Was that. So you learned a lesson. I got a bit of a lesson, yeah. yeah. And, um, you looked up to him though, didn't you? Oh, absolutely, absolutely, mm. yeah. And um, he, um, his son Colin was my best mate growing up. They, he stayed at our place, or I stayed at their place. And sadly, he died at about 21 years of age in a car crash. Mm. At a similar age um, that my father died. So I mm. think at one era in our life, he was probably shorter son and I was probably shorter father. Mm. So when I started shooting, you know, he was he was like a godfather to me, and mm. uh, yeah, certainly look up to him. Yeah, of course. Come, come back to that. I mean, c- coping with that sort of stuff is a very difficult thing. You have to probably grow up a little bit faster. You've got a, a, a mum and sisters to think about, yeah. and, and so on. What sort of impact did your dad's passing at that? What did you say? It was nineteen, I think you were. Yeah, when you, when yeah, I was went. nineteen, mm. and um, my father went from seemingly t- healthy to dead in a month. And um, I'm not even really sure what he died of. My wife remembers better than me. She wasn't mm-hmm. there, of course, but mm-hmm. she's got a better memory than me. Mm-hmm. <coughs> um, 
But I was home on the farm looking after the livestock and looking after the farm and my mother was travelling forwards and backwards and forwards to the hospital and then all of a sudden, just before he was due to come home, he had a fall and he died. Mm. So that was a bit sad and I'm sure my, my mum and my sisters worried because the tearaway son that set fire to the wardrobe, mm. and I wasn't setting fire to wardrobes at the time, but mm. I was still a bit of a tearaway, long-haired lout mm. and a little bit wild and I used to, as I said, the, the pub was between our two farms, mm. so, so I suppose they had their concerns. And But I, I think I got a bit of direction from my uncles, mm -hmm. uh, you know, whether they were um, blood uncles or, you know, inherited uncles. I mean, mm -hmm. you had plenty of people. My father was so well respected that the community, I think, made sure that I was um, on the straight and narrow. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, I, I suppose it could have went one of two ways. It could have uh, could have ended badly, but it, it probably, my sisters say, saved my life. Mm -hmm. Um, but, um, you yeah, know, knuckled down and uh, did what I had to do to look after the family to raise the family, so. You talk about yourself in a joking way as a pretend engineer. You're way better than that because you're... I'm not much better than that. Because... I, I reckon you are. You, under, you undersell yourself. You've, it might be the hands-on learning that you've done, but you're, you're very good. I know that in all sorts of different ways when you apply that craft. Does that come from necessity from the farm learning to kind of weld and to... to I mean, you, when you farm, you have to be adaptable. You've got to fix things. And, and is that oh, kind of, of where it started? Well, of course it is. And uh, we built a lot, of bu a lot of buildings when we were mm. young. My father, we built everything. Mm. We, we had to build everything because we had no money. Every bit of machinery we had was... Uh, I think the youngest piece of machinery was 21 years old. And um, so my father would be fixing things and I'd be driving things and bussing them. And it, and but he he said a couple of things that I've always remembered uh, about things. He said, when you build something, it has to be a cross between what you know is true and what looks true. So when someone says, well, it's it's got to be right, Rusty, because it's straight, hmm. but it doesn't look straight. <laughs> so a com it had to be a combination of halfway between the two. Uh -huh. So we would sometimes have to fudge roof lines and things to hmm. go. Well, we know that's straight, but the rest of the building's not. So hmm. we need to alter that. But he had only a bit of an eye for inventing, a bit of a, an idea for inventing things, and he had a bit of an eye for what looked right. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a rally cars and the way you design things is a mm. bit, bit like boats. Mm. If it looks right, it is right. Mm. So, so quality workmanship was kind of instilled in you, to, in a yeah, sense? Yeah, I think so. But mm. thinking outside the square a little bit, I mm. mean, when I started rallying, people had a, a, con a preconceived idea of what worked and what didn't work, and that's what they stuck with. Mm. And, you know, I bumped into scrutineers that said, well, that won't work because I've been rallying for 15 years and we don't, don't do it like that. And I'm going, just because you've been rallying for 15 years doesn't mean you've been doing it right mm. for 15 years. You've mm. probably been doing it wrong for 15 years. Mm. So I was fairly opinionated and throughout my rallying and indeed my life, people haven't died wondering what I was thinking. Mm. So, and my mouth got me into a trouble a few times, but it also got me noticed a bit. Let's talk more about that a, a little later. Firstly, to, to wrap up the farming, aspect just just let people know the kind of farming involved and then what happened when you when your dad passed because there was a bit of a, a split of the family farm yeah. you worked it for a while and so on didn't you yeah worked it for a while we had two farms as i said one that we lived on was uh, pretty rough and rocky and um, ironically 20 kilometers away the other farm was pretty sandy okay and the sandy farm had three lakes on it which is where the water skiing comes but yeah. when my father bought the farm um, there was no water, and I think he got a bit of a discount because they couldn't find water, but you wouldn't believe it in, I don't know how many years later, but maybe, well, certainly before the Mecca earthquake, so it wasn't due to the Mecca earthquake, but mm. the water just started to rise in the ground. The water level rose to a point where three lakes formed, and people used it for swimming and skiing, and of course um, I was just a tearaway son of the bloke that owned the <laughs> lake. So we didn't have much money for a boat, but we had plenty of people that had boats, and being the son of the owner, you got to ski a bit. And, um, but when he died, he left that property to my mother and my sisters, and I farmed it until the younger sister turned 21, and then I had the option of whether I bought it or what I did, and I, I made the decision to stay with the home farm that I inherited with my mother, and uh, ultimately I bought a slightly bigger farm up near Meckering. Now, I don't know if it's that particular property with the, the lakes and so on on it, but Dean talks very fondly about the, the water skiing and, and it almost kind of became a purpose-built venue, didn't it, for select people to use, is yeah, that right? Ab yeah, absolutely. Well, this is another thing my father, it's probably still on the maps, known as, you probably still see it as Heritage's Lake. Heritage's Lake, yeah. And Heritage's haven't owned it for 45, 50 years. Okay. Uh, it's either Heritage's Lake or Nielsen's Lake, but a lot of, it depends on the age of the map. And, um, but he made that, that lake available for everybody. 
and uh, he built um, like big, big amenities, change rooms, a big shed to be shaded under, reticulated lawns, brought in power, made toilets, uh, flushing toilets. Um, it was like it was like a, 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 a park. ski park. Yeah, yeah it was yeah. like a park. Mm. And once a year we would have one event a year called a Lakehana. We just threw a name on it where we raised money to do other things, and it was just a big party basically. And I was just the, the layabout son that just made a nuisance of himself. And, um, but when my father died, um, his mates were movers and shakers and they helped him do those things. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really have mates that were movers and shakers. I had mates that were uh, yeah. farm kids or... Mm. I wouldn't say that. I, I didn't hang around with the wrong people, but mm. they, they, weren't, they weren't the generation that made stuff happen. They were the generation mm. that kept things going, you know? Mm. In, in talking about the skiing part, before we move on here, you can you can barefoot and beach darts were kind of an oh, easy yeah, thing yeah. for you and all sorts, weren't they? Yeah, I won two uh, two state championships barefooting, so it was certainly no problem for flying dock starts or one foot barefoot or rope on toe one foot or tumble turns or or things like that. So I, I probably didn't have some of the technique that others had, but I had gritty determination because uh, the two championships I won were what they called Ironman championships, and that was basically who could barefoot the longest. And in a, on a, in a, not a very large lake, that's not that easy because after one lap you run into your own weight pretty quick. And so then the lake starts to get a bit rougher and rougher and after three or four laps that um, you've got a bit of a job on your hands. And I managed to win that. But the, uh, but the West Australian Barefoot Association would come up to our lake to conduct that. Wow. So, and we had a barefoot jump. We had a proper ski jump on the lake and a proper slalom course. And we travelled the state a little bit when I was younger and my sister was younger. Uh, and just competed in tournament skiing and tournament barefooting in later years. Yeah. Dean and I do some work together in broadcasting now, your, your son, and he says he can recall as a young fella you starting to instil in him the, the importance of precision around the driving. So as a, as a young fella, y you needed him to operate the boat in certain places on the lake at certain revs at certain times in order for the barefooting to work for you. And he, he knew, even back then, the, the importance of hitting those marks. Oh, of course. It, as I say to people now, and people are still trying to ski and people are still trying to do things, half of the skiing is in the driving. And a driver can make it look very bad or can make it look very good. <laughs> but uh, his, his job was to make me look good and to show off I needed things to be right. Mm. So I, you don't have someone just tearing away at 50 miles an hour. You're barefoot at basically 38 miles an hour. No. Yeah. And if you want to do one foot, you need to go 40 miles an hour. But when you're doing, when, it's, when, the, uh, when the one foot session is finished and I want to do some tumble turns, you better come back to 37 miles an hour. And so this was the type of thing. And when you do the beach start or the flying dock start, you certainly need the timing right to, to get the boat going, but do not go 38 miles an hour until I'm on my feet. Yes. Or nearly on my feet. You've got so, to time all that. Oh, yeah. Of course. Mm, mm. And um, I remember one particular occasion, my mate that I used to do a lot of skiing with, Terry, I was doing, in front of everybody, of course, because I'm a bit of a lair, <laughs> the flying dock start, and the dock was, I don't know, three or four foot above the water. And in actual fact, it was a shade house that my father had built, and the water had come up further up the land, and the shade house was now in the water. So, so we now use it for something. We'll just sit on top of it. I oh, know what we'll do. I'll do a flying dock start off the top of it. <laughs> so I do this, and as I do this, my mate Terry, he, he guns the boat, and he, and he says, well, Robert lands, and he lands with his feet around the rope, and he'll sink, and then I've just got to accelerate up, and, and he'll be submerged. But he eventually pops up, and well, on this particular occasion, the timing wasn't quite right, and I did submerge, but when he put the power down in the big 400 Chevy, my feet were back over my head, <laughs> and I'm in a, a bit of a banana shape with the rope stuck in my groin here, with the, code, with the, with the observer saying, Terry, you better, he's, no, no, he always gets up. Well, I wasn't coming up and I was stuck in a bit of a folded, folded position with the rope until I eventually just got it to go between my legs with a bit of bruising and fortunately kept <laughs> some other things in fact. Kept, kept the parts in so the timing wasn't quite right on that occasion. So showing off has its, has its drawbacks it has sometimes. Its, has its drawbacks. Yeah. Um, just to, for the audience, quickly, what was the Iron Man, was it distance? Like how, how, long, how long was that? And when you talk about the flying start, not just the beach start, does it involve a run and a jump, or what does, it, what does that involve? Well, it does, because you can do a bit of a... 
it does require a bit of a run and a jump because yeah. basically you have to be floating on top of the water and you're not going to float at two miles an hour. Yes. Or you might float, but you're not going anywhere. So you've got to time the amount of loops of the rope and um, and you've got to sort of go, yep, and the boat's idling out. And at this point you go, go. And as you're watching the, the rope unwind, unwind yeah. you've got to start running and take two or three very quick steps and jump in the air just as the as the thing's taken up and you better be on your back and this, your feet better be somewhere near that direction and when you get up to another bit more speed you then stand up on your, your feet. Awesome. What was the Ironman distance that you got to? Don't know. Don't know. It was because it was, and we didn't time it either, we basically mm. just, they might have timed it, mm. but it was laps around the lake. Lake, okay. okay. And some people could do one lap, but one lap wasn't going to cut it and uh, I could do three and three quarter laps. And I don't know why it's three and three quarter laps, mm. but by the time you do the start and you stand up over there, you've lost a quarter of a lap. Mm. So from the time you're on your feet, but you come around past the crowd, remember? Yep. So that's one lap and there's another lap. And it's always better to finish your barefoot run letting go of the rope. In front of the crowd. In front of the crowd. <laughs> and preferably a bit more speed, once again, this is important, mm. to be able, enable you to whip yourself towards the crowd. Yes. And you ski on your feet and land standing at the beach. Yes. That's what you've got to do. <laughs> Walk off in style. Walk off in style, yeah. <laughs> And you've got to be a bit careful there. But, and this is one of the problems. I, and you're pretty, you get worn out pretty quickly because mm. it's, I forget how far it is. Maybe it's, maybe it's 10 or 12 minutes, but that's yeah. a fair while. Yeah. Maybe it's not quite that long. But I, you only want to do enough to win. Mm. Mm. And if I was the last skier, I'd know exactly what that was. Mm. And I think one of the first year I was the last year, so I just held on until, mm. uh, until I won. Mm. Uh, but the next year, I don't think I was the last year. So mm. as I'm hanging, hanging on and I'm getting very tired and I'm thinking, well, what I've got to do, and your legs are starting to tremble and your back's starting to give, and I'm thinking, well, at what point do I just give this up? Mm. And I think I gave it up at maybe four and a quarter laps or something, or I, don't, I can't remember. But I remember the very last year went within about a half a lap of with me Beating. watching him going round and round thinking, well, this is not looking so good, but fortunately he fell off. And that brings me to another point, and I don't know how this happened one day, but you know, here I am saying I could do three and three quarter laps. That was sort of it. And all the tricky stuff only happens in the first lap because you get a bit fatigued. You can't do the tumble turns or the one foot or the one you're foot open toe when you're worn out. You're just starting to stay on. Mm. But one day at the same lake, the same size lake, because you know, go around the trees, there was a line of trees, and because we, we blasted out the trees to make the room. Um, one day, I don't know what happened, but I got to three and three quarter laps in front of the crowd, and I thought, I'm feeling pretty good, I'll try and do another lap. And I did another lap, and I thought, that's four laps, I'm pretty puffed. I'll make it five, it's a nice, that's a easy number. And this is where it gets a bit bizarre. So I got to five laps, and then I'm thinking, well, I'm still holding up, okay, I'll go to six. And I went to six laps, and then I don't know what happened. I get into something in your mind or something happens in your body. And I think this happens with, this happens at an Olympic level. Mm. And eventually I struggled it out to 10 laps. And I don't know why. For all of my skiing, and when I was a young man and when I was fit, and, mm. but I don't know what, whether the speed was perfect or whether mm. the water conditions were perfect, because it's not only the fatigue, mm. it's, the wear, it's the burning of your feet yes. is the problem. Mm. And if the water's too cold or too smooth, it burns your feet because the water pressure's in one place. Mm. So whether there was enough ripple to spread the load, and once I got to 10, I thought, well, I might as well see just, and I went to 11 laps and eventually I just let go. And I, next time I went out there, I three and three quarter laps, I was pretty stuffed and I've gone too hard. Yeah. And why did I ever, how could you ever get to a point where, mm. so when you see some, and I wasn't on drugs, I've never no, had no, a drug no. in my oh. life, mm. a little bit of alcohol, mm. but somehow in the middle of all that, in the middle of when I was either fittest or when my mindset was right, mm. I achieved something that was my mm. personal best by miles. miles. Mm. And I've never been able to quite work that out. But occasionally you get that in rallying. Occasionally you get to a situation where everything is happening so well for you, you almost mm. seem slightly removed from, from what's going on. Mm. You just feel like you're almost sitting back looking at, mm. at what's going on. And, mm. and you get to the end and it's, it almost seemed effortless. But other times you're just working your absolute ass off and you think, I just cannot get anywhere near where I need to be. But mm. other times it just happens. 
couple of things to take away from that, which I reckon will permeate a bit of this conversation. Do what you need to win from a preparation standpoint, and then obviously the, the mental aspect of the, of the yeah. game. Can we move on from the, the farming here? Because you end up, I may not have the order of things right here. I know you had a transport business for a while, but you ended up working for Massey Ferguson on the, on the sales side, I think, didn't you? And you, you saw that as a window of opportunity to move into the transport. Is that right, the transport side of things? No, I think, well, yes and no. I, um, when the farming was struggling, and at one point I, I sold the farm that I still have, but the person who bought it, I got in very cheaply. Mm -hmm. I wasn't necessarily in big debt, but I could just see that my son Dean wasn't gonna become a farmer. Mm -hmm. His mother didn't really wanna be on the farm, mm -hmm. and, um, and I could see he probably wasn't going to be, so there was an opportunity to get out, so I got out. And the person who bought the farm went broke, so I got it back. I didn't necessarily want it back, but mm -hmm. I got it back. Mm -hmm. But I'd started to do a bit of contracting and um, just with a, an eight tonne truck and carting sheep and livestock, because this is what you have on the farm. So yep. I'll just supplement the income. And um, so there I was selling tractors for Massey Ferguson, but I was also delivering the tractors and contracting the, the, the work. And so I think the, the manager of the Massey Ferguson business got a bit tired of me making more money than him. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the tractors weren't easy to sell because they, they, weren't, they weren't brilliant tractors at the time. Mm. They still make Massey Ferguson equipment, they yeah. made good equipment. No, the tractors were okay, and they didn't have enough tractors. I think that whatever they were trying to get me to sell, didn't want to sell, and they, <laughs> I couldn't get enough of what I could sell. So um, eventually it got to the point where he said, I, I think you, well, you might be worth your money, but I just can't yep. put up with the fact that you're, that you're selling the gear and then you're transporting Sporting the it. gear and yeah. So. And the transport was, was uh, in the end, I think a number of trucks and it was cattle, but all sorts of things, weren't yeah, you? Yeah, it was, yeah. Mm. So basically, I ended up with uh, four or five trucks and four or five trailers and contractor drivers and and it took a bit of managing, managing but it was probably the, the wrong size business, but it was a good lifestyle. We lived mm. on a property just outside Northern. We had a 10 acre property where we ran the trucks from and and Dean was probably never going to be a truck driver either. Hmm. So um, eventually, and I was in the transport business and it enabled me to get involved in the rally business because it turned over a bit of money and there was, um, you know, you, you did deals with the suppliers, like hmm. I had a deal with Michelin tyres for their rally tyres because hmm. I used Michelin tyres on the truck and, and the local fuel distributor was happy enough to sponsor me because if I bought the fuel from him and um, for the trucks and um, so you could leave us some leave us some sponsorship awesome rusty talks the international language of rally he says he doesn't have a kiwi accent but hayden Patton might beg to differ hayden made it all the way to the wrc and the fire still burns inside for that top flight competition 26 maybe. Uh, if something like that does happen, I would love to give it one more crack. And I'd love to give it a crack with our own team, do it our way. Um, I definitely feel like there's unfinished business there, especially, you know, the guys, no, like the guys that are there now do an amazing job, like driving those cars is no mean feat, the, the commitment, the, the speed, everything. But they're all guys that we used to compete with still. It's still the same group of guys and they were guys that we backed that we could beat a few years ago. So, um, yeah, for sure I'm not at that level now because I haven't been there, but I backed myself that I could get back to that level. So, um, yeah. You can find Hayden's episode in the Rusty's Garage Library. It's sweet as. Now back to the No BS convo with Rob Herridge, bro. How did the, the first rally car come about? Accidentally. Was it Datsun 1600, am I right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. well, like most people. Yeah. Um, it happened accidentally. I, um, I don't know how, but I ended up with, I don't know, six or $7,000. And I was going to buy another boat. Maybe I sold one of the boats I had and I was going to buy another boat. And I decided on what boat I was going to buy and it was advertised and I went around to the bloke's places in Perth. And remember, this is before mobile phones and before, it was Sunday Times. It wasn't market, it was just, you read things in the Sunday Times. Mm. And I was in the country and I happened to be Dean's mother, you know, my first wife, you know, her family lived in Perth, so I was probably down there. I'll go and buy this boat, I've got some money. And this is for offshore power boating at the time? No, this is for inshore. I inshore. finished okay. with yeah. the um, offshore, or I mm -hmm. hadn't started, I can't remember, but yeah. I was going to buy another boat. Yeah. And uh, I got there and he didn't want to sell it. And I've gone, oh, it's a bit disappointing. I've got six or $7,000, which was a bit of money. And then my, uh, his mother just found, said, oh, well, that's bad luck. And uh, friends of ours were going on holidays. And she said, well, let's go with them. And uh, I said, okay, well, I don't know about the money. She said, well, I know we've got some money because we're going to buy a boat. Yes. 
Okay, we went on holidays and we spent $4,000 and I came back with um, $3,000. And it was once again on the floor of the uh, in-laws house and I'm, looking at, and I'm looking under boat or I'm looking under bike, I'll go and buy this motorbike because I've seen the motorbikes. Well, I've got a few motorbikes, mm. as you know. And uh, I went around the bloke's place, beautiful CVX 1000 Honda, $2,800. I don't want to sell it. <laughs> and I think, what the hell? Mm. People, <laughs> don't they want this? Is my money not good enough? And so the same weekend, Rua for Rally Car. I'll go and, I'll go and, I'll have a good rally car. So I went around to this bloke's place. He couldn't start it up because it was 10 o'clock at night because by now, because I wasted time on a motorbike. So I'm obviously going a bit stir crazy with money in my pocket. And um, I didn't buy that one either, but I went uh, the next day to buy, spent $2,000 on a Datsun 1600 that had no engine. <laughs> it, was, it was a rally car or a road yeah, car? No, it was a rally car. Yeah, yeah. And I knew it was a rally car because it had mud on it. Uh -huh. And it had a long distance tank in it. It had done the round Australia rally. Okay. And uh, had handles on the boot, I think, didn't in case you got bogged. And you no, I put up. the handles oh, did you, on the boot. Did you? This <laughs> is my preparation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I bought it home and, of course, Dean's mother was aghast that I should spend a couple of thousand dollars on this rally car. It doesn't even have an engine, so I've sourced bits of engines in Northern. How much did you know about rallying at this nothing. stage? <laughs> I knew nothing. <laughs> I, <laughs> nothing at all. I've seen it on TV. I was 14 years old and I saw the 1968 London and Sydney rally on TV and I thought, that's me. But of course now I'm mid-twenties, I don't know, mm. am I? Am I, am I, I forget. Mm. 1983. So what am I? Am I, I don't know, I'm nearly 30. So I was born in 54, so nearly 30. It didn't start rallying until I was nearly 30. And um, so I'm building an engine at my mate's place in Northam. I'm running the transport business and he's got a local garage and I've, he'll help me but only Saturday morning. So I'm down at his place on the main road. And as we're working on this engine, I see these rally cars drive past. That's a rally car. I've got one of those. And another one drive past and I've shot. Next rally car that comes past here, this is the main street. I'm gonna run out and stop them. So I did. And uh, I said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm going on a rally. Where are you going? Well, I'm going to Southern Cross for a rally. What do you have to do to get started? Oh, well, like me, they just fob you off. Well, you do on a car club. Okay, what are their names? So during the week, I travelled to Perth and I joined the light car club and I went around to Wendy Cattell's place and, and I ex said, well, I need to be a member, apparently, and then you become a member of CAMS and you get a book and... And I said, well, I'll intend to win some rallies. And he went, yeah, right, sure. <laughs> We've heard that story <laughs> for a few times. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so I went on, I found out where you had to go and I went on a rally. Crazy. There is a funny story around the transport to one of your first rallies. Well, it was the first rally. Was it the very first rally, yeah. was it? <laughs> you thought you were kind of world champion, <laughs> didn't you? Well, I, I've got a truck, mm. right? So... We put it on the truck, and when I put it on the truck, it's got a loading ramp, and I just put it on the truck. And I'd take the family, I think, maybe I had a caravan for our water skiing. I can't quite remember. Yeah, I think we did have a caravan, so I got my mate to drive the truck. So we arrive at the venue, and it's a place called Hoffman's Mill. It's in the middle of nowhere, so it's a crossroad like that in a bush. Mm -hmm. But I've read in the supplementary regulations that the catering is gonna be handled by the Hoffman's Hilton. Now, I know that's now, just a joke yes. that it's a tent, you know. <laughs> but I was looking in the paper for the Hoffman's Hilton to maybe stay there. And I've got to tell you, there's no hotel in Hoffman's Mill. <laughs> so I don't know this though. So and I've read nothing about, I've got the rule book and the only thing I've read in the rule book, because I intend to win, I'm car 50 out of 60, is that if you catch someone, they have to make every attempt to move over and if necessary, let you past. That's the only thing I know. So when we get there, and everybody sees this truck roll up and it's everyone's camping there because there's nothing there. And of course, nobody knows me. I'm, there's 70, 60, 70 cars in it and this truck rolls up. And as I'm backing the, the car off on two very rickety bits of wood, because I loaded on a ramp, didn't need the wood, but now one bit of wood is a lot stronger than the other. So it's staying like this and the other bit's like a, a plank Boat. and it starts doing this and it's only about that wide. So everyone started to go, oh my God, father, look gonna, at this. It's going to tip off. <laughs> yeah, and you wouldn't believe it. Halfway down, the horn sticks on. And I have no idea what even go on. So it's going, <laughs> So everybody who wasn't looking is now looking. Okay. 
And the only thing that would turn it off is if you turned the steering wheel, because for whatever reason it, but the board's only this wide. So to get it off, it's going beep, 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 as I'm backing the bloody thing off. And by now I've got everybody's attention and I eventually get it off and get ourselves sorted and everyone got on with their business. And of course, I'm now very nervous and we're starting our first rally and I pay, pay no attention to the first 50 cars leaving because I'm due to leave whenever and it's night time. And eventually it was our due time to start and they said, five, four, two, two, one, go. And I... Like a scalded cat. Like a scalded cat <laughs> in the camping ground at the, at the start the person with the flag jumping out of the way and me tearing down the eight kilometre transport faster than anybody has ever gone because I don't know the difference between transport and competitive. <laughs> I passed the cars on the road, off the road, screaming at them because they wouldn't get out of the way. Haven't you read the rules? <laughs> <laughs> and by the time I get to the start of the first special stage, I'm puffing and panting and can't believe how how terrible they are at not getting out of the way. And then I've screamed past all the cars to a stop at the control point. Them all just lined up nicely to start the stage. But I've seen it on TV. You come flying to the control at 100 miles an hour <laughs> and the co-driver jumps out and gives them the card. And that's what he did with everyone ducking for cover and the dust all settling around the place and with me puffing and panting inside the car. Who is this bloke? <laughs> and when he come back, he said, how do we go? And he says, we haven't started yet. <laughs> I'm going, oh, really? He said, apparently that's a transport stage. I said, what's that? And he said, we haven't started yet. <laughs> right, so I composed myself and the first stage was um, eight kilometres long and I was better than a world champion because you thought I was fast before, <laughs> I am now into it. I couldn't believe that the road was a road to start with because it's now just a track and I've been practicing on the Shire roads mm. around Northam, mm. which are pretty big yeah. and only got a corner every few kilometres. But there was a lot of corners down there, I can tell you, and zigzagging between trees. I was thought we were lost half the time, but I got to the end thinking, well, I surely have got to have won that. And then when he got when he come back with the time, I said, how did we go? Puffing and panting even more. We got beaten by two minutes. I've gone, that's got to be wrong. There's no way that someone can beat us by two minutes. And I said, right, well, we'll protest when we get to the end. Well, we got beaten by two minutes the next stage and the stage after. Ironically, it was Ross Duncan that won the, the stage and the was rally. It? Was it? And I would eventually become... Good friends with Good him. friends mm. and competitors. Mm. He would drive for Mitsubishi mm. and I'd drive for Subaru. So an only... I don't know how many years, eight or nine years I was driving It's the bloke that was when, it's, it's a, a bit bizarre, isn't it, that that, awesome. that should happen. Awesome. Tell me about the car. What, what did you, I mean, the great thing about Datsun 1600s even now is that a lot of parts are, are quite compatible. You, know, you could put 240k gearboxes in yeah, and things course. like that. What, what sort of engine did you have in it? What sort of <laughs> modifications was a, was a green it, Rob Herridge making in his first attempt at rallying and rally cars? Well, I was using uh, yellow paint because my brother-in-law worked for the main roads and he could get Just yellow paint. Just become a trademark colour yeah, for you, yeah, hasn't it? Has, it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that one happened accidentally. Mm. Um, but you know, I could fabricate things and I could fix things. Mm. And, um, but I didn't get a chance to, to um, modify much because I crashed in one weekend. I crashed a few. Mm. And then you'd buy another one for $200 the next weekend and then you'd spend the following weekend putting everything from one car into the other because it was all just bolt-in stuff, like you said, transfer mm. it over. Mm. And then you'd go out rallying. I remember one rally I did the first year, I had three different coloured doors on it. They're trans doors, I identify as yellow. <laughs> <laughs> but eventually I ended up with a, um, a factory engine. This was probably going into the, the, the second year. After about three or four rallies, uh, I got a, my co-drivers were just me mates mm -hmm. and they couldn't do it. They, they would like me, they get, they get mm -hmm. motion sickness. Mm -hmm. So after two rallies, my first co-driver, Sean, who ended up driving one of my trucks as well and was a good mate, he mm -hmm. said, no, not for me. And the mechanic who helped me, I'll do a rally for you. He did one rally or maybe two, no, nah, not for me. So I ended up with a bloke called John Pursehouse having, uh, helping me. And mm -hmm. he was a driver, he wanted to be a driver, but he didn't quite have the money at the time. Mm -hmm. I'll do the co-driving for you. Very first rally, I think we got fourth outright. Wow. And we went from nowhere to fourth outright. And then we went to Kalgoorlie for a, a rally, which was pretty open country, mm. as you imagine. Mm. And we got third outright. And so I was hooked. 
you know, I'd come from grade four in those days. It was grade four, grade three, grade two, grade one. So I was winning grade four and grade three and grade two and grade one and, and outright. And um, so I was hooked. So over summer, I put in better seats and a, a, a better trip master and hadn't got yet to the hot rod engines or anything. Anyway, we went to start the next year and he said, well, no, you can't do the first event. And I've gone to this, my coder, well, why? And he said, well, I'm, I'm going to direct that rally and we have to do one rally a year we call a stand down event and that's my stand down event and I'm going to direct it so you can't do it. And I've gone, well, I can do it and I'm going to do it. And he said, well, you can't do it without me. You won't do any good. And I've gone, really? He goes, well, why do you think you did, did well? I went, well, I was thinking I could probably drive okay. And he goes, well, I think it's because I was doing the, the good co-driving thing. And I've gone, well, <laughs> you might think that. So I found another co-driver and I showed John Pursehouse. He's a mate of mine still, yes, I must yes, say. Yeah. Anyway, in the first stage of the first rally next year, I plunked it into a tree pretty hard. So um, he, had, <laughs> he had the last <laughs> laugh of saying, yeah, I think it might have been a fair bit to do with his co-driving as well. Classic. But eventually, when I was looking to make the engine go faster, I bought an engine off Bob Nicoli, mm -hmm. and it was an ex-George Fury engine from yep. out of one of the stanzas. And um, he said, uh, it's a $3,000 engine, but Rob, you could get 1,200 for your engine, you know, I'd already put Webers on it and things. Mm. Bob, why don't you give me 1,200 for it and I'll give you 1,800. And he going, okay, I'll do that. Cause he was on his way to England to, uh. to make his mark. Yep. Ultimately it didn't work out that well for Bob, but he was at least gonna give it a shot. Mm. So I ended up with a, a proper dry sumped factory engine. And now I need a proper gearbox. Like you said, you could mm. put it. So the proper gearbox was a, a, uh, an op, what they call an option one gearbox. It had the, the proper ratios, but it was, it was drug money. It was $2,400. But I couldn't see why you wouldn't have one because a 240K gearbox, which wasn't right, and then you mm. change the first three ratios to do all that was $1,200. I'm thinking, why don't you just buy the proper gearbox, gearbox for $2,400, right. mm. mm. which I did. So, and of course the bloke I bought it off, Daryl Penley, you know, he had a business called Automotive Tuning Centre and he was Mr. Rally, Mr. Rally Tuning. Mm. And yeah, that's where you bought the stuff. And he's gone, Rob, you know, you're one of the few people who bought and walked in here and just say, give me a gearbox. So I did and I put that next to the factory engine and it went like a jet. Jet, yeah. It crashed pretty hard when it crashed. Though. Did it? Yeah. There was... some, were there some lessons in all that, like in the, in the crashing side of it? You know, I mean... You, yeah, try you, not to. Yeah, I know, of course. <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is a funny yarn around, I think it's John Macara. And you two might have had a bit of a, like a, bit of a rivalry thing going and he couldn't fathom whether, or perhaps he, he, in his mind, he thought your car's got to be quicker. Well, he thinks that of everyone's car. Does he? Yeah. Okay. But, but, but in order to resolve this, he, I'm paraphrasing here, but, but I think he has a conversation with you around, um, uh, right, uh, come out to this property where I regularly run the cars, yep. etc. I know the piece of road, I'm going to drive your car. Yep. And um, you agree to this, which, which is pretty rare for most people. Well, I don't agree to it automatically, but uh -huh. you know, he was, he was the man, he was, he was fast. Mm. He was the bloke that could win. He could probably win an ARC round. He never did, but he was probably fast enough at one point. Mm. And the fact that he even showed some attention to me was flattering, but he probably had more idea of the fact that I had a fast car. And mm. he invited myself and another up and coming driver called Jerry McGrolde out to what they call Turkey Farm Road. <laughs> which is up near the lakes area. And it's, yep. it's not that far from Northam, so easy for me. Yep. And you shouldn't be there because it's not a controlled piece of bush. It's okay. just bush. Okay. Yep. So but didn't worry John McCarr. Yep. It didn't matter where you weren't supposed to be. We were there. <laughs> and uh, it was there don't, at night. Don't do this now, kids, but that's how it yeah, was back yeah, then, kind yeah, of thing. Do not do this at home. <laughs> yeah. And um, so he would, we would fly around this track and maybe it was four kilometres. It was pretty dangerous because there's trees and there's no control and there's, but this is what he did. And he had some piece of rubbish, bloody RX2, that he had to push to. So, and I went, went with him, and I'm sitting in this car thinking, how dangerous is this car? Like, it's, it's his practice car. It's got no roll cage, it's got terrible seats. And he drove like a madman. And, and I had to time him, it was my job to time him. Like, everything he did, he timed. Even if we went out to tea, which we did at other times, he would have the time from the last rally in his pocket and lean over in the middle of the movie and say, yeah, the last rally, and that's the reason why. And you go, what the hell? So I had to time him, and as I'm sitting there, I'm thinking, this is looking pretty bad. If the roof comes down, I'm trying to squeeze down like this, <laughs> trying to get below the door level, <laughs> trying to sort of look over. And I scared myself stupid while he was driving. And then when we got to the, the deemed flying finish, I'd press the button and it was like 
four minutes 16 or something. And it was terrifying. So eventually, during that night, I don't think I could match that. Hmm. But he would insist that he had to drive my car. But I would think, right, well, I'm coming with you then. Well, you coming with me, you've got to time me. So off we went, and I was just agog. I wondered he would drive my car so hard, and I thought to myself, if I drove my car that hard, I would be that fast as well. But I generally didn't. He didn't have mm. a lot of sympathy, I didn't think. Mm. I'd never loaned you my girlfriend. So we thrashed around there, and I was thinking, oh, one more, honey, another kilometre to go, and I was t- terrified the whole way. And mm. as we flashed across the finish line, I was sweating bullets. <laughs> and as first words out of his what time do we do? What time do we do? And I looked at the clock, and my hands were shaking, and I hadn't pressed it. <laughs> hadn't hit the stopwatch, hadn't you? <laughs> <laughs> stopwatch. And I was just in the, the smartest thing I've done in my entire life. In a flash of inspiration, I've gone, I'm thinking, well, he want to do it again. I've gone, what time do you think you did? <laughs> oh, that would have been a 4.15. I've gone, no, it was a 4.14. Yes! <laughs> Didn't have to do another run. <laughs> that was me, I was done. No more turkey farm road. No more going with Tom McCarran. That's the end of part one of my pod with Rob Herridge. The first of three stages in this one, if we were talking rallying. Yep, it's one of the few feature eps in our library with three parts. Jump back to the garage when you're ready and give the second and third instalments a listen. How he would win his second Australian title before his first, when it was fought out in the courts and why he never gave up on it. Doing a promo shoot with the legendary Ari Vartanen in Rob's car when Ari discovered that Rob had removed the handbrake. Who needs a handbrake in rallying? We'll talk about his son Dean's decision to pursue a career in the sport as well that would ultimately see him become part of the Subaru family and work beside the legendary Possum Bourne as well. All that and more here on Rusty's Garage.